Here's a word, and that word will come from the book of Psalms 50. I'm just going to read a couple verses. The Amplified Bible. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills or upon the mountains where thousands are. Verse 11. I know and I'm acquainted with all the birds of the mountains and the wild animals of the field are mine and are with me in my mind. We're going to stop right there and pray uh, right where you are. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you this afternoon, God, that you give us an understanding of the Word of God. God, give us discernment. Teach us, God, uh, how to understand your Word. Grow us in our faith, God, that you'll get the glory. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm going to come down the floor. Um, you know, we're in our financial teaching, and, and look, uh, under my understudy of Mother Barbara over the years, you got to have a lot of notepads, a lot of information. So uh, <clears throat> I pray that you guys got something to write with, because uh, you just can't teach financial teaching without have, having a scripture to go with it. Financial teaching don't work well having it being a topical subject. Uh, because you can get away with a regular sermon, but when you're doing financial teaching, people want to see it in the scriptures. And so, uh, because money becomes sensitive to many people, and so they sometimes struggle with understanding and even trusting the Word of God. So, uh, so I pray you got a notepad and something to write with to jot down. So I'll be giving a few scriptures that, uh, but it's good to go back and study and see it on your own as well. Um, we, we are opening up with the title of it is What's in Your Cup? What's in Your Cup? And that's, that's our vision for the year. The cup, uh, the initial for the C is clarity, and the U is understanding, and the P is purpose. And so uh, we're going to focus on the clarity. So all during this month, uh, we're going to break down that to get us a really clear understanding. Sometimes understanding money in the Bible and how it works and the purpose of it, uh, it, it, it uh, can be confusing. There are more scriptures in the Bible about money than any other subject besides the kingdom of God, which suggests to us is that God wants us to know how it works. As simple as that. He wants us to know how it works. And those who are visiting for the very first time in the month of January and August, those two months, those who are members of Voices know those months we, we set aside time to teach on finances. And, uh, and so each, each month, um, January and August, each year, I try to bring it from a different perspective. And we're going to look at it differently this time as well so that we can get a clear understanding. So the clarity of the tithe. We want to know what is a tithe and why do we tithe. So a tithe, according to the Bible, it's a tenth. It's 10% 10 of one's increase. So it's not just one's payroll, but however increase comes in your life. And it's an increase of one's growth. So we're understanding a tithe means a tenth. And also the Bible says in Leviticus 27 and 30, is that not only is a tenth, but it says it's holy. And it says it belongs to God. So it's as simple as that. that those are things that we've been teaching for a long time. So we're not strangers to that scripture. We're not strangers to understand the tithe is holy and it is God. So the focus we want to focus on more, the clarity of it is, why do we tithe? And a lot of people in church, the reason why I had to ask God the question, because there's a lot of people, uh, my son Kaylin reminded me, there's a lot of people in church to say, the reason why I don't give, because I don't know why, I don't know where the money is going. I've been hearing that since I've been on the earth. And that's, that's, been, that's been something the body of Christ has said probably since the beginning of time. And so, um, so we want to use the clarity to talk about all of that and to let you know how your tithes and offering are working and what it's doing in the kingdom and how it's, how it's growing and a testimony of Ariana just sharing with you uh, because of the, the things that we're doing in our youth and throughout the church. And so we're going to talk about how the tithes work with all of that and what the kingdom says about that in all of our personal lives. So, but I, but I, wanna, I wanna set something up for you right now. Um, the tithe was not put in place for God's benefit. It's not, it's not to benefit God. God doesn't need our money. So I, I, need, you to, I need you to get this in place. God put, put the tithe in place for his kingdom because he uses it to replenish the resources. 
if the church is tithing and giving offering, we, we, we would feed every homeless person in DeKalb County, in Gwinnett County. If the church is doing their part, there'd be no need for fundraisers. There'd be no need for any of those things. The reason why there's a need is because we haven't done our assignments. So the, the tithes are not, not about God. God doesn't need it. God uses it. This is how he this is how he disperses things in the kingdom. This is how we go and win souls for Christ. This is how we help a mother who's lost a job to pay a bill. This is how we help someone uh, get housing. We've done all of those things, and we need to do a better job of sharing that with you. But your tithes are working all the time. So the kingdom, the purpose of tithing, is to make sure that the church, God makes the church responsible for taking care of the needs of their people. But when the church is not given the tithe, when the need of our people arise, we don't have the monies to give it because we didn't do our part as God blessed us. That's the whole purpose of tithing is that God blesses you to live a wonderful life. And all he asks you to do is give him a tenth back to his church so his church can continue to use marketing and evangelism and things to be able to do to be able to advance the kingdom. All right, so I'm giving you the wise today in our teaching today so you'll understand it's kingdom-minded. So one of the mis biggest misconceptions about the believer is that God needs the money. And uh, God don't need our money. He already owns it. As a matter of fact, Deuteronomy says it is God who gives us the ability to get wealth. That's what the scripture says. So God was the one that gave you what you got. So God doesn't need it. He's the one who gave it to you. And so, no, we need God more than God needs us. I promise you. And so, so I want you to go back to the text. I want you to read Psalms 50. I want you to understand God is talking. Look, put it back on the screen now, and let's look at what uh, Psalms 50 is saying. God is speaking. He says, if I was hungry, I'll uh, put verse 10. I'm sorry. Put verse 10 on. For every beast of the forest is mine. God's telling you, I own it all. And the cattle upon a thousand hills, all the, upon the mountains where thousands are, God said, it's all mine. Look at verse 11. He said, I know and I am acquainted with all the birds of the mountains. God said, I know them all. He said, and the wild animals of the field are mine. He says, and are with me in my mind. God said, I know every single person on the earth. I know every strangle of hair on your head. God says, I know everything about you. I know more about you than you know about you. God said, everything is mine. I created it. So look what he says next to him. It messes me up for a second. Because in verse 12 he says, if I was hungry, I would not even tell you. I don't need you. He said, I don't need you. You need me. He said, for the world and the fullness of it, it's mine. I could make a billion of you. God said, I, I want you to understand, you ain't doing me a favor. That's what he's telling you right now. Let's look at verse 13, he says here. He says in verse 13, he says, shall I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Look at verse 14. He said, this is all I ask of you. When I bless you, don't forget me. Offer to God the sacrifice of thanksgiving. This is the key verse 14. Highlight that in your Bibles. Highlight that. God is saying is, God said, how you honor me and bless me is how after I bless you, after I give you the blessings you asked for, God said, when you come to the house of God, honor me like you really appreciated me. He said, honor me with the sacrifice of thanksgiving. He says, and pay your vows. The word vow means promise. Well, pay your vows to the Lord. What does he mean by that? He says, when you were in trouble, you came to me and said, God, if you can get me out of this. Have anybody ever been in trouble and God got you out? I know I have. I know I have. I promise you, I have. And, and God got me out. How, how many has he got you out more than once? Raise your hand. Can anybody say over and over and over and over again? He just keeps doing it. And God says, you have said a lot of things when you were going through it. 
God, if you can get me out, God, I'll be at Voice of the first Sunday in 2020. God, you just get me out, God, and God, I'm telling you, God, I'll be the loudest one in church shout. If you just get me out, God, God, I'm going to be in there, God. Oh, God, I'm going to give back to you, God. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to give offering. I'm going to do this here. And God say, keep your word. God says, when I bless you, keep your vow. He said, that's all I ask is that when I bless you, he says, give me an offering, a sacrifice of thanksgiving. So he's saying to you, as I bless you, the tithes and offering, it should be an, an act of appreciation and honor toward God. That's all it should be. We shouldn't be coming to church grudgingly. And I hear it every year, twice a year. Oh, Lord, Bishop about to talk on that finance again. I hear it every year. Oh, God. Oh, man. I just... Hate this. It shouldn't be grudging. You should be excited. I got to tell you, my whole spirit has changed. Elder Early, I used to struggle teaching on tithing. It was like a chore. And I did it because God told me to do it. I was like, oh, God, they don't want to hear this. God said, teach it anyway. And I said, God, oh, God, they don't hear it. I tell my wife now, I said, I can't wait to January to get here. <laughs> I, it's just my whole spirit about teaching on it has changed because I understand the things God has done for me in, in ministry. I begin to understand what God has done. And so look at verse 15. Call on me in the day of trouble. Look what it says here. And I will deliver you and when I deliver you, you shall give me honor and glory. Glorify me. God says that when you give tithes and offering, you have, you honor God and you glorify him. I'm going to show you in the word of God. I won't talk about stuff I won't give you scripture for because we're not just going to be blabbling and nothing is showing you in the text. But I want you to understand it is an honor. It is an appreciation. It is, it, when we do it, we glorify God in all that God is doing. All right, look at Psalm 66. Let's go and see. Let's look, let's, let's put the rubber to the road and see what David said. David said about this about dealing with God and honoring God and all that God is doing in the kingdom. He said, you sent troops to ride across our broken bodies. We went through fire and flood. These are people that was busted, disgusted, didn't have any money. They struggling financially. And, and David is saying, I went through all of that. Didn't know how I was getting my bills paid. and Didn't know how I was gonna come through. And, and David said, but in the end, you brought us into wealth and great abundance. David says, I went from a poor shepherd boy to one of the wealthiest men in all of Israel. He said, God, I had nothing, and you blessed me. I'm just trying to tell you, God has brought some of us from a mighty long ways. You ought to give God praise for that alone. And David says, David says, I was struggling. I couldn't pay my bills. He said, life was difficult. I was going through it. He said, but God brought me out of it and didn't just bring me out of it, but made me go from being poor to being wealthy in rich, richness. And so look at verse 13 now. I want you to see, he said, now I have come to your temple. I like the word temple. It's to the church. We're going to discover that. The reason why God wants you to bring the tithes and offering to the church is because that's where he disperses it. There's got to be men and women of God in his church that he assigns with integrity that when you bring your tithes and offering in, that money goes to help somebody in need. It goes to win a soul for Christ. It goes to lead somebody to Christ. It helps somebody who's struggling. A few, uh, last week, a week before last, before Christmas, one of our members, uh, we, uh, we brought her up on stage and we should never have brought her on stage. But we brought her on stage. I told her, I said, she ha the people have to see you in order for them to give. I, 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 because remember the story was that she came up and uh, she, her job cut back and she lost uh, uh, some of her money. She lost her house. She had to put her furniture in storage. And, and then while in storage, the rats ate it up. It was all on the news, on the local news. We brought her on stage. Her little daughter was with her. And, uh, and the loving church that we are, uh, got together and gave her monies and gave her furniture and all of that. Well, guess what? Uh, that was kingdom, by the way, but we should never have had to have done that to her publicly. If all of us were tithing and giving offering and sowing seed the, the, uh, and bringing your tithes and offering to the storehouse, we should have done that privately. Give God some praise, I'm just telling you. 
She should never have been able to be put on display and a daughter never would have been embarrassed if that would have happened. But, but the church, no matter what church it is, if the church itself is not functioning right and tithing and giving often and bringing it to the storehouse of God, if you don't bring it, then the, God leads the church and the ministers of the church to disperse it where need be so that when that's one of the members have fallen, now you can help them with housing. Now you can help them with furniture. Now you can help without having to come to the church to raise money because you've already done your part. Come on, give God some praise. That's when your tithing is working. It's not about us. It's kingdom. It's not about us. It's about the kingdom. So when you bring it to the storehouse, you saw what David said, and I'm bringing it to the temple. Why? Because the priest, the pastor, the bishop, they are responsible for making sure that the monies are, are dispersed toward winning souls, evangelizing, marketing, helping our mercy ministry, who's the baddest mercy ministry anywhere this side of heaven. Give God some praise. They're doing real ministry. When one of our saints in the church gets sick, they are there. Well, guess what? They need monies to do that. Our outreach ministry are wanting to go places and reach people in the community and, and, and around the globe. They need monies. Well, when our members in our community and the homeless and all the stuff that's going on around us, our angel tree ministries and all of those things you are doing, but when we are tithing and giving offering, we shouldn't have to raise a special offering because when the church do its part, we have the monies to take care of those when they get down on their luck. Come on, give God some praise. That's why we tithe. It's kingdom. So put the text back up. Put, put up on the screen what David just said in verse 13. He says, now I have come to your temple. Your temple, he's talking about God, with burnt offerings to pay my vows. What vows? The promise he told God, if you can get me out of this, I won't forget you, God. And David is showing God, I haven't forgot you. You've made me wealthy. So he's coming to the church. You're going to see that. You're going to see that. You're going to see that word church. Temple, sanctuary, storehouse is to the church because the church's job is to disperse it. So look, so he says, to the church, look at verse 14. So he says, for, I, for when I was in trouble, he's telling us right now, I promise you many offerings. And now you've blessed me. And now you've got me out of trouble. Look at verse 15. That is why I'm bringing you these, look at this word, fat. Male goats, fat rams, fat calves. He's telling God, I'm giving you the best that I have. The smoke of their sacrifice shall rise before you, God. You will see when I get to church, God, I'm going to show you my appreciation. I'm going to show it to you. Look at verse 16. Come and hear. Now he's, down, now he's giving a testimony to other people on how he's prospering. All of you who reverence the Lord, the word reverence means to hold in high esteem. You really love God. You're not playing with him. You love him for real. He said, I will tell you what he did for me. David's giving a personal testimony, so he's telling you this is the reason why I give. Tithing is not a command or a demand. It ain't forcing. It is a revelation that opens your eyes that the reason why I'm tithing because God's been good to me. Watch this. In order for you to tithe, he's already blessed you. Amen. You ain't tithing to get a blessing. You already got a blessing. That's why you're tithing. You keep tithing if you keep getting more blessings. But you can't tithe unless God has already blessed you with something. So when you tell God, well, God, you know, I love you. I can't afford to. How you cannot afford to do it for the God who blessed you with it? You just chose to do something else with it. But the fact that he gave it to you, you could afford to do it. So he says, and look at verse 17. So he says, for I cried to him for help with praises ready on my tongue. Verse 18, he says, he would not have listened if I had not confessed my sins. Why is that important? Because God don't hear sinners. So in order for God to hear you, you've got to ask God to forgive you. And once you ask God to forgive you, now his ears open toward your conversation. So verse 19, he says here, but he listened, he heard my prayer, he paid attention to it. Verse 20, our last verse, blessed be God who didn't turn away when I was praying and didn't refuse me his kindness and love. So David comes to the temple to give God the best that he has. Tithing and offering is not about us. It ain't about the pastor. It's about the kingdom. So when you don't tithe, you stop the kingdom from advancing. You really do. You, you, you got to know why. Why? 
That's a lot of work. That's a lot of souls. I had a thousand members last year. Uh, uh, God allowed us to win souls at this church. Can we give God some praise? Come on, bless the Lord. We had over 100 new members came from uh, our, our um, connect at the end of the service where you can, you can text in saved or unsaved. Uh, it's called text in church. We use that. We have to pay a bill every month. But we paying a bill through your tithes and offering. We use it to win souls. How many of y'all get my daily, uh, my five days a week uh, encouraging word? See, several of you. Five days a week. How many of that have been blessing y'all? You have to come at the right time? Well, guess what? We have to pay for that every month. So that if that's encouraging your faith and keeping you uh, steady while you're going through a trial, that has to be. Guess what it's doing? We're using your tithes and offerings to pay for it. So that we can keep you encouraged and keep you strong. I can't tell you how many people have told me, Bishop, they've come at the right time when I was going through some stuff and it strengthened my faith to trust God. We got over 6,000 people uh, every day that receives that. Over 6,000 and growing because it's, it's inspirational messages every day, Monday through Friday. And it's changing lives. Well, guess what? Ties and offering is doing it. So when you don't give it, see, it's kingdom. If we get the money from you and don't do anything with it, you have a right to leave the church. You have a right not to give. You have a right not to do anything. But what have we done? We've taken the money that you've given, the tithes and offering, and we've built a daycare to raise up godly children. we built an academy to raise up godly children. Come on, give God some praise. We turn it around in Rockdale, build a sanctuary to teach God's people. We build a, we, we build a shopping center to be able to uh, house and, and employ and take the monies and go back and use it. There are sometimes our daycare, for whatever reason, did, didn't meet, meet its budget, but because uh, it's kingdom, we've taken our tithes and offering and we've used it to make sure that the children are being uh, taken care of. You, you, uh, we don't do enough of sharing with you. Your tithes and offering are working. It's kingdom. It ain't about nothing else. The light bills, that's a part of it, but those, that's so minute. It's about bigger things than that. It's kingdom. Let me show you. That's what I'm trying to tell you. That's why I'm so glad God knew what he was doing. That's why tithing wasn't forced. Tithing wasn't a command. Tithing was, was, wasn't a, a dumb man. It was out of love and appreciation. Let me show you in Genesis 14. Turn there. Genesis 14, and we're going to just look at verse 18. Uh, because I want to show you, uh, Abraham's uh, nephew Lot was taken, and uh, Abraham gathered all of his men together, and they had taken all of, the, all of the, their monies and their, all of their wealth and all that, and they took them. Abraham and his men went and got them, took them, defeated them, destroyed them, and not only took back Lot's wealth and his men's wealth, he took back the enemy's wealth. So now Abraham now is, is, is rich beyond measure. And he's, and he's rich, rich, and he's rich. And I want you to see what happens here. This is the first time you ever hear tithing in the Bible and it's not mentioned about the law. In verse 18, where you see Genesis 14, 18, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Look at verse 19. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessed of heaven and earth. Verse, verse 20, and blessed be the most high God who had delivered thy enemies into thy hands. Stop right there. Is that Melchizedek, who's a, who's a type of Christ, he's a high priest, but he tells Abraham, he said, do you realize the wealth you just received and the victory you just had came from God? And soon when Abraham acknowledged that God gave it to him, put that text back on the screen because I want you to see it. The Bible says God didn't ask him for it. He didn't force him to do it. He didn't demand it. And the scripture says, and he gave God a tithe of all. It wasn't pushed. Abraham, that's why God called Abraham the father of faith. Abraham set a high standard for all of us to follow. He blessed God without God asking him for anything. First time tithing, tithing wasn't associated with the law. God had to add tithing to the law. Tithing was put in the law hundreds of years later. Because even Abraham's grandson, go to, go to Genesis 28 and 20. Even his grandson... Jacob, we know him as Jacob, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob said to him in Genesis 28 and 20, he said to him, and Jacob bowed about. He made a promise saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way. Look what he says, that go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, verse 21. And he says there, so that I come again to my father's house 
in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. In verse 22, our last verse, and this stone which I set for a pillar shall be God's house. And all of those things, God, that if you do for me, look, it's a promise of vow. I'll give you a tenth of everything I have. It wasn't a command. It's an honor. It's an act of appreciation. Tithing and offering was an act of appreciation. It wasn't a commandment. You know when God made it a commandment? When he started blessing us and we didn't show him love. And God said, wait a second, I am blessing my people. I'm giving them houses. I'm giving them wealth. I'm making them rich. And they have forgotten about me. And so because we didn't show the appreciation and love toward God, an act of kindness and honor to take our offering and give God back a tent, God forced Moses to make it a law. Look at Deuteronomy 14, 23. We're going to read from the uh, Living Bible. It says, it bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose. Uh, look, his sanctuary. I'll tell you to highlight that. You're going to see temple. You're going to see sanctuary. You're going to see storehouse because God always disperses the tithes and offering in the sanctuary, in the church. And it's up to the church and the people uh, up there who have integrity to be able to utilize that money for whatever it needs to be done for. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, olive oil, and the firstborn of your flocks. Highlight this last part right here. See what it says? The purpose of tithing. Look at what it says here. Is to teach you what? Always to put God first. God has to put tithing in law to teach us how to love God back. Something wrong with that picture. Think about that. God's blessing us, and he's seeing that we're not blessing him back. And now he has to make it a law to make you give. Wow. It tells us we are ungrateful. When tithe and offering ain't about us, it's the kingdom. It's the purpose of it is to share the wealth and to bless others who are in lacking. So if the whole church is giving tithes and offering, now we can change our community. Now we can get every homeless off the street. Now we can be able to do a, be a major force in ministry. Our mercy ministry will be equipped with even more stuff than what they're doing. It, it's not about us. It's about kingdom. And so because the people wasn't doing it automatically, it's a shame. He's got to put it in law to make you do it. So the purpose of tithing is to teach you. Why wouldn't we have that inept ability in ourselves to be grateful and say, you know what? You've been good to me. Let me turn back and bless you. I guess it's not in us naturally. So God has to put it in law for us to do it. Think about it. I want you to, I want you to understand how good God has been. All of us raised our hand on how many times God brought us out over and over again. This is going to blow your mind. 50% of the church, Voices of Faith and the global church around the world, 50% of the church gives zero every week. Not a dollar. This is, this is you Google it, it, it is a national stat. When you come to the house of God, it, it, it's a celebration of what he's done for you. It, it's a no-brainer to honor God with what he asked. He said, the 10% is holy, it's mine. And, and, and because God said Abraham started it, I decided to let it be uh, the standard. Abraham started it. That was no way. God didn't force him. But when Abraham did it, God said, you know what? That's going to be the standard. That's going to be mine from now on because of Abraham's heart. Yet, 50%, that is a lot of people. And so that now, now people get upset with the church. When they're going through some stuff and they come to the church and the church don't have the money to help them because the people didn't give a tithe and offer. And the purpose of it is to bring it to the church so the church can take it so when one of our members are down, you help them. But then now the people leave the church and go back and badmouth the church and say what the church is not doing. But if you look at their records, they ain't gave a dollar. I'm just telling you the truth. They're asking for more than what they gave. 
It's the truth. But I'm telling you, I'm trying to get, we got it backwards. We keep wanting God to bless us. And when he blesses us, we don't come back to thank him. We don't come back to thank him. So, so, so remember now, tithing is kingdom. So tithing is, 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 is the favor of God. Tithing is God, you bless me, I bless you back. You do what you do, God, and God, you bless me with all of these wonderful things in the kingdom. And so when you learn to do it, God honors us in the process. So, so, so look at Malachi. This is something that we already know about, Malachi 3.8. We already know about it. He says here, this is the Living Bible. Will a man rob God? Surely not. And yet you have robbed me. What do you mean? When, when did we ever rob you? You have robbed me of the tithes and offerings. Do me. God is telling you is do him. It's do him. All I'm doing today, guys, is showing you why it's do him. It's to honor him. You don't need it, but you honor him by returning back to him like David did, like like, like Abraham did, like Jacob did, like Isaac did, like all of them did. They honored God in the process. That's why David, and you read the first Chronicles 29 on your own time, David says, I want to build God a church because I want God himself to come and have a place to dwell in. You know, God is a spirit, so God is everywhere. He said, but I want to build a sanctuary so that when we come in here to pray, he's with us. And the people got so excited and fired up, they raised so much money, David had to tell them as enough. We had enough to build a sanctuary. Watch this, a sanctuary he would never see built. Because God had already told him earlier, your hands are full of blood because he's a man of war. He said, I won't let you build it, but I'll let you raise the money. Now, now, how many people are going to raise something they ain't going to benefit from? Not many. David loved God so much that he raised money for a building that he would never see. God said, I won't let you enter my building because your hands are war. But I'll let your son Solomon build it. And David did it with such joy because of his love for God. He understood kingdom. Your tithes and offering ain't about you. It ain't about me. It ain't about the pastor. It's about kingdom. That's why you give. So that, so that even though you ain't going on a mission trip, you went on a mission trip. Even though you weren't at the mercy ministry when they went to go, go visit a dying believer, you were there with them. Even when the monies were gave, given, um, uh, we had Bank of America, we had our, our fraternities and, and, and sorrows, we had them giving money toward the angel tree. Why? Because it's kingdom. They understand that the church, if the church is operating kingdom, they're taking the monies to be able to bless others in need. Let me show you. We're almost finished. Acts, go to Acts 4. I'll show you right here in the Word. Acts 4.32. I'm reading from the Limited Bible again. It says, All the believers were of one heart, one mind, and no one felt that they had owned what they owned was his own. Look at the kingdom word it says. Everyone was sharing. Your tithes and offering, when you deposit into the church, it now allows us to make better decisions. Who's in need? How can we advance the kingdom? How can we reach our goal in 2020 of reaching, uh, reaching 1,000 more members? How do we take our text in church and advance it? How do we do marketing? How do we do television to reach goal? Because our ultimate goal is to win souls. But in the process, he gives us enough funds and resources for the believers to take it and help those who are going through, right? And so look at verse 33 now. It says here, and the apostles preached powerful sermons. Why? To encourage the people of God about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And there was warm fellowship among all the believers. Look at verse 34. And there was no poverty in the church. Nobody was struggling. Why? Because when you lost your job, the church, because of the tithes and offering you gave, helped somebody until he got back on their feet. It says nobody was struggling, no poverty. For all who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money to the apostles. Well, the apostles is the church. And what? And the apostles did what? To give to others in need. So you say, I don't reason why I don't give because I don't know what they're doing with the money. Well, where do you know what they're doing with the money? Tell me. Where do you know what people are doing with the money? You, we, we involved in a whole bunch of, whole bunch of organizations. We don't know what they're doing with the money. And we're still giving. But it's something about the church. It's just the devil that gets in our spirit, man. 
And to say I'm not going to do it because I don't know, there's a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations. You know, um, you know, I've been a part of organizations. I've been season ticket holders at, uh, for the Atlanta Hawks. I ain't call them up and say, hey, what y'all doing with the money? I said, because the money I'm giving y'all, this team stinks. What's going on with the money? I didn't say that. I said, y'all got to do something better than that. Y'all got to get some better players. I'm paying too much money. And you got the nerve to raise the price up in the offseason. Nah, y'all doing something with the money. Nobody does that. Nobody does that. We don't do that. No, we don't. Que- we only question the church. Only question the church. So watch this though, y'all. Is that now they bring in the money, they bring it to the church, the apostles, the apostles, they're giving it to people in need. And in the next chapter, you get a chance to read on your own time. Two people, husband and wife, they, uh, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, uh, they, they went and sold some land.